Team, what is up? I am giving away a Tassie Tiger knife. And for you to go into the draw, to be able to win that, you just need to go to becomingabowhunter.com and a little pop-up page will come up asking you if you would like to join the email list. Uh, and on that email list, you will get contacted by me. Um, you'll be in that in, in the draw to obviously win the knife, but you'll also get some, some little emails and notes from me along the way. Um, it's been really well received so far. And a lot of people are really loving the emails and the content that I've been sharing there. So if you'd like to get involved in that, um, once again, it's becomingabowhunter.com. You'll get the chance to go in the draw, but you'll also be joining the new email list that I've started. Um, so once again, becomingabowhunter.com to jump in and get your chance to win a Tassie Tiger Knife. This week's episode is brought to you by Dog and Gun Coffee. Um, I absolutely love my Dog and Gun Coffee. I am on a monthly subscription with them. Um, I get the Samba blend. It's the one that I love. It's like a dark blend, which is really nice to drink as a black coffee, which is the way that I like to drink my coffee. But at the moment, I've also got some leftover um, drip filters, which are the, the preloaded drip filters that um, they sell. It's like this little pouch that you can essentially, like a single serve pouch, you rip the top off and can pull the little sides off, little flaps off and, and peel it over the side of your cup essentially so it's a, uh, it holds it in place while you can pour your hot water straight over the top and have coffee no matter where you are so it's really great for while you're out camping or hunting um, or if for instance you just don't have a coffee machine you can just have coffee wherever you are as long as you've got the hot water which is awesome but something that I really admire about Dog and Gun apart from obviously all the conservation work they do is some of the collaborations they've been doing recently so they recently did um, a collaboration with a brand, Franchi, which I, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing it right, but it's like a, a um, wild hunting um series essentially and, and with Beretta Australia as well um, and then the most recent one that they've done is with oh sorry I'm on their page right now scrolling through to see it all is the Black Death that they did with um, Blood, Blood Origins um, and it's funny because I was talking to to Sean about Black Death a while ago and he, he said how much of um, a wild following it has and he doesn't understand it because as a, a coffee connoisseur he feels like it's just burning the coffee but to be honest people absolutely rave and go crazy for it and I have not tried it yet myself, but I'm very, very excited to try Black Death. Um, but anyway, you guys can get involved with Dog and Gun Coffee and use their coffee, use their hot chocolate, um, and get $10 off your next order with the code BOWHUNTER. That's all in capitals. BOWHUNTER will give you $10 off your next order. Hey there, and welcome to Becoming a Bowhunter. I'm your host, Matty, and join me and our guests as we take the quality of meat back into our own hands. Searching the wild for free-ranged animals to harvest as ethically as we can. I interview a variety of specialists from the bow hunting community to help fast track your journey as a bow hunter. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this chinwag on one of your favorite topics in the world, bow hunting. Team, what is up? Welcome back. Um, I'm really excited to be sharing this episode with you. This episode is um, with Grant and Corey, and this is during the hunt, so pretty much the last episode you heard with me doing with Rob, who was um, pre-hunt. We would got there. We had all the um, pre-hunt jitters going on, place that we'd never been to either. Either of us have been to, and then Corey and Grant are the two guys that hunt here the most, and so to get there and be able to hunt with these guys has been absolutely incredible. Um, I hadn't actually got a chance to go out with Corey, and to be honest, um, I got to get my first a species with Corey on the very next day which is also really exciting um, something I might do a podcast about later but this is in the heat of the moment um, we we definitely had a few drinks so um, pre-warning that there might be a few swear words thrown here and there um, hopefully you can understand but there's also a lot of laughs and a lot of things to laugh at um, and very excitingly for me was kind of the first massive mountain ball that I'd ever had a chance to to get onto. And so during the podcast, we're actually boiling out the skull and doing some of the measurements um, and unpacking that because it's stuff that I'd never really learned about before going through like the Douglas scoring points and whatever else. So um, something that you now get to learn as well whilst you listen to the podcast, but it's really full of some really cool stories, some really good learnings. Um, Grant has an incredible work ethic and something that he passes on to what he's doing with um, – with the the cockies and the the owners of the of the um 
of the properties that he hunts. And I think realistically, um, there's a lot to learn in how you can potentially gain access to a property, but then also keep access to a property once you have it. So I think there's there's so much in this podcast that is just so valuable for us as a hunting community. Um, but also there's just a lot of learnings that can be can be had for each individual bow hunter as well. So um, yeah, hopefully you guys really enjoy this episode. I know I definitely enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed the trip. It was an absolutely incredible trip. Some of the best hunting I've ever done. Um, so yeah, sit back, relax and enjoy team. Guys, welcome back to Becoming a Bow Hunter. Sitting here in deer camp. It's actually the first in camp podcast I've done, I think, which is incredible. Um, but first of all, Grant, I want to say thank you, mate. Thank you for, for having me. Um, you're very generous with giving us the space to use, but also very generous just with your information, generous with, I guess, the whole experience in general. It's been incredible. So thank you first of all. Uh, that's all good, Matty. Thanks for... Uh having me on once again yeah you're uh you're a veteran now third time yeah it might be one time too many <laughs> maybe three times too many depends <laughs> on who's listening and we've also brought in cory cory what's your last name simonsbergen cory cory simonsbergen yeah sounds better than it spells <laughs> well mate welcome thank you i just met you tonight you're a good dude i've seen plenty of photos of you and that's about it yeah yeah that is about it i've been off social media actually for Probably 18 months now. Is it freeing? It is. Yeah, it is refreshing. Yeah. yeah, can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. But um, you put down some pretty good critters. Yeah, I try. I Yeah. I'll get in the hills and have a go. I don't, I don't uh, shoot the best, but get some good things down. <laughs> but um, actually, Grant wanted to... to he, he said pretty much like he's put you through the ringer to get you to where you're at now. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah. In what sense? Tell us. Like you, you were a late onset hunter. I was. I never hunted at all and have no no connection to hunting or anything at all. That hunt. No, that's right. So what? It was. Was it Grant that influenced you? Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, it, well, I always camped. I was always in the bush and camping. My wife and I, we'd like to do a little bit of camping and all of that. But Grant was getting out and doing that and also hunting and and we did a what well, was a venison spit at our mate. Ryan Judd's house, one Arvo, and and I said, how'd you do this? And he shot it with a bow, and <clears throat> that was it. I said, you got to tell me how to do it. And I reckon it was a good year of me nagging him to teach me how to do it. <laughs> and it was, well, go and buy a bow. Go and buy a bow. And it was a good year back and forth at that. And then, yeah, went and bought the bow. What bow did you start with? I started with a, it was a Hoyt Power Flight. That's like... Power Hawk. Yeah, yeah. yeah so one of like the mid-range bows to start yeah, with, essentially. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. It, it's funny because that bow was Grant's bow. Then oh, it so was, you bought off him? No, I didn't. The story goes, <laughs> that was Grant's bow, and then Grant sold that bow to his brother, and then his brother sold it to our mate Ryan, and then Ryan sold it to our mate Brock, and then I bought it off Brock. <laughs> Done the rounds. Yeah, he did the rounds, and now Grant Grant got it back off me. No so way. So hanging no on the wall as a trophy, that one. Yeah. Was that your first bow, Grant? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it's, oh, Yeah from many moons ago when I first kicked off and um, yeah, it's had a, a few strings and a few modifications done to it over the years, but yeah, it's seen oh, heap of, heap of goats and a heap of pigs taken. Um, I think Corey's the first person to shoot a deer with it. Um, it's still yet to kill a buck and it's currently on the wall at Ian's place waiting for a new string and I might next year bring it up as a memorial thing and try and finally get a buck with it but <laughs> we'll, we'll just see what happens it's uh i won't be letting it go put it that way it's got no, too many that's memories incredible. that's so cool to see it go through so many so many dudes right to be able to use it especially within the same friend group that's incredible yeah it was cool because that bow that bow was the first for everyone and all of those blokes that had that first bow still have a bow today so mm. it is pretty cool yeah but that, that that was the start of it so i bought the bow and then the bloke wouldn't take me hunting <laughs> what were the requirements he's told me already but what were the requirements yeah, so for everyone to know at 20 meters i had to have a grouping of five arrows at 20 mil and then 40 was 40 mil and 50 meters was, uh yeah, 30 was 30 mil and 40 was 40 mil so 40 mil we're talking within pretty much yeah all, all your shots within a tennis ball yeah, yeah at 40 meters and i had 38 meters i lived at barrack point and i had 38 meters with a a tree in my backyard 
and on my one knee shooting under a tree all the way back from one side of my property all the way to the back side <laughs> of the property. Yeah. And my neighbor was a bow hunter as well. And he said, you know how loose this is that you're practicing 40 <laughs> meter shots in a residential? And I had no idea what I was doing, but yeah, now I look back at it and it's pretty red hot, but I've got, to, I've got the green light to come hunting with him. <laughs> so um, I actually think that's a great standard to start with, right? Be, because he obviously made sure you were ready. How much did you actually practice before you got out? Every single day. For a whole year, pretty much. Yeah, it was a little bit less than, it was probably nine months, but every single day. Yeah. And, yeah. I lot, think that's great. Yeah. I actually think that should almost be the standard. <laughs> yeah, well, it was my own proficiency course through Uncle Randy's archery shop. That's what I used to call it. <laughs> so let's talk about then your first kill where you came out. Was yep. it a, a like, you actually, let's talk about your first shot at an animal. Was it a proficient shot? Was it good? Yeah, it was. I was shot it a, a kill shot straight up? It was. One arrow. Oh, <laughs> I won't get into the first one, actually. <laughs> it wasn't. No, it was horrible. It was a 40-meter shot at a goat, and I should have, shouldn't have taken it. And yep. I killed the goat with one arrow, but it was through the neck. Mm. Yeah, well. Anyway, that was the first one. But that same day, um, shot, a little, shot a little boar, and, yep, yeah, one arrow, smoked him, went 20 meters, died, got the photo, and then shot a, like a pretty decent, yeah, black, well, black billy, probably, you know, good good-sized billy, and... Yeah, one shot again. Yeah, wow. So that was before the drought, and this place looked looked like it does now. So. so, so how long have you been bow hunting for then? When did you get into it? I don't know the year because I'm useless with <laughs> my memory. Before the drought, so the drought was what twenty. I'm gonna say. Started. I'm gonna say my daughter. I was at Barrack Heights. My daughter was three, so seven or, seven or eight years. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, and so, do you have any any? Um, I guess feedback for the men as a mentee to the mentor do you have any feedback or was it a, was it a good oh, good experience sure. yeah yeah definitely yeah well he taught he, yeah, he, he's taught me everything i've hunted 2016 there you go yeah no um <laughs> june 2016 there you go now um yeah he's great grandy's great he he gives this opportunity to so many hunters every year as well mm -hmm. not just not just me like he's done it to so many hunters which is pretty cool which is pretty important in the bow hunting world as well. I think, yeah, I think it's massive. It really is. His, he didn't just teach me how to bow hunt. He taught me, taught me everything, butchering the animal, mm -hmm. making sausages, doing everything, because he established himself. He's been doing it for 15-odd years, you know, hunting. He was a rifle hunter before he was a bow hunter. Mm. So, no, yeah, he's good. Grant, tell us about that. Why, what's, your, what's your thoughts around that? Why do you, what's your passion to bringing other people into camp? So, I started bow hunting. Um, oh, it was purely just an opportunity that arose. The father-in-law was working on a farm. He said, I've got a place that you can shoot deer, but you can't use a rifle. And I went, I'll get a gun. How hard can this... Uh, I'll get a bow, sorry. How, how hard can this be? So, I went down, brought a bow, started practicing... I had no idea what I was doing. Like, absolutely no idea. And at the time, there was no... Like social media, it was either magazines or the forum. Um, and then I ended up linking up with a fella I used to play footy with um, and another friend. Uh, he was a year younger than me at school. Uh, that was through Facebook. That was probably 12 months after I started like my bow hunting journey. Um, and it was just useless. Like I was shooting groups and it was nowhere near what the requirements I set Corey up to do. Like <laughs> I was um, like, I'd shoot five arrows and be happy if they were all in the Reinhardt at 20 yards. <laughs> um, and you know, the bow was out of tune. Everything was out of tune and I terrible form. I learned everything the wrong way. And then I had a couple of people help me, uh, show me the right way. And from that, I sort of went, well, like he's, um, Scotty, give me this, like, give me the opportunity. Showed me a few things and, and taught me a lot about it. Um, and I figured, well, I if I have the opportunity to be in that type of position where I've got you know access to a good place, it's got a fair few critters, and I can you know point people in the right direction. That's going to be beneficial to those people, and then yeah. hopefully those people can do the same thing and the same thing, and it just try and help the bow hunting move forward in a positive direction mm -hmm. is sort of that's that's probably my driving force behind it like i 
I want to see other successful bow hunters. And if you're not out doing it and you're not getting shown the right way or, or taught the right things, well, you'll never, you'll never get it. Like, unfortunately, the social media thing, it's just all about, you know, who can kill the biggest or yep. the best. And no one goes back to those, like, grassroot basics, you know. Shoot a your goat. first rabbit. Shoot a goat. Yep. Yeah, shoot. Yep. Go and shoot a little... Little pig, little titty sow. Yeah. Like, it's a pig, irrespective of whether it's a massive mountain boar or dirty little sow. It should be celebrated all the same. Mm -hmm. It's a bow kill, as long as it's a clean, efficient kill. And, you know, you've practiced, you've put the work in, you know your effective range and you're doing the right thing. One, by the animal, but two, like, by everyone else. Because if... You do the wrong thing, you know, stick an arrow in a kangaroo, it runs around a golf course, everyone sees it, <laughs> ends up social media and we all get tarred with the same brush and yep. it's really, you know, a couple of people doing dumb shit and we're all getting we're labelled as idiots. So. I think that is like everyone has to have their own ethical moral compass that they build and you'll build that over time as a bow hunter. Like it's not something that's going to come day one because you don't have any experience with it. Um, <clears throat> but it's definitely something that I've learned very quickly over time with, okay, what what shots am I willing to take and what shots am I not? And what shots do I do in practice versus what shots do I do in, on a real animal um, that is, is acceptable for me? Um, and it, it's a very it's a very quick learning curve that you have, but it's a very good one as well. <laughs> um, and I wanted to say this place is not just like a this place is like a little hunting winterland. It's uh, like amazing. It's a it's a a haven. <laughs> um, I, like I, I, I was saying to Rob yesterday um, or the day before, my hunting experience is kind of like you get one opportunity, one opportunity. No, a fucking microphone. One opportunity in a day. <laughs> and um, if if you, you ruin that opportunity, you're pretty much done for the day. Like maybe you might get a second chance later, but that's pretty much it. Whereas while we've been here, we've had we've had many opportunities. It's been great. Like a, as a as a big piece for for Rob in particular has been a very brand new to bow hunting and being able to give him many opportunities. Um, like we've had many stalks and I think one of the biggest things, and it was even a big eye opener for me was on the pigs, the actual way that we can approach them. And I've always been a very aggressive hunter in regards to, I will always try and make the stalk reasonably fast and get, make the ground when I can make the ground. But with the pigs, one of the big eye openers for me was how bad their eyesight was and how much of ground you can actually get up on them. Let's talk about your approach. Randy, when, when you come up to a pig and what are your thoughts? What what's your what, what are the things that you're looking for when you're, you're hunting a pig, whether it's a big mountain boar or a small little sow? So it's you've, you've left me with an open-ended question because it's two different approaches. Like a big mountain boar is different to like a mob pig or a normal sow or something so like that. So let's start mob pig first then. So pretty much head down, ears are sort of floppy and relaxed tail's either swishing or it's or it's relaxed and the mannerism of the pig's relaxed, do cartwheels. <laughs> literally. Literally, I'd like, yeah. And Maddie said Rob was blown away by how quick we stalked in on them and stuff like that. But literally, like, when their head's down in the dirt, digging up, they got two foot of grass around them, like, everything's muffled. They can't hear anything. And... The wind changes so quickly. If you're not making meters, the wind is going to get you before you get the opportunity to be within range. Mm -hmm. So you have to re like it's almost a full send if they're showing the right signs, like you know, floppy, relaxed ears, head down, feeding, and the tail's just sort of casually moving. If them ears are pricked up or their tail stiff and they're not swaying or anything, they're standing still. Stop. That's Obviously hunting for the wind. Yeah, that's how like I approach the the little ones. And obviously pigs have really poor eyesight and really good sense of smell. Um, big old mountain boar on the other hand, you gotta go a little bit slower. Like you can still get away with a little bit, like as as you worked out from your one the other day, you can yep. you can make the meters when it's available and it's not that much different, but with a mob pig, if you make a little mistake, they'll look. They sort of move their head around and go, ah, that looks pretty good. And they put their head back down and keep feeding. Whereas that, that old mountain boy, he looks up, goes, 
this ain't right, I'm out of here, and that's it. You, You're done. You get one yeah. opportunity, and, yeah, you don't normally get a second look in from them guys. What do you reckon their effective eye, eyesight is? 10, 20 metres? Uh, 30? Look, I, I reckon they could detect your movement maybe out to 50 metres, but I think it's very, like, basic. Like, they just see... I'm not a pig, I'm not a scientist, so I don't actually know, but I'm <laughs> presuming from the experiences, they see us in like a sort of a pixelated or a blob version. It's movement they so discover. Movement, rather. Yeah, like yep. if you're still, they can't really pick you apart from a tree or something like that. Whereas if you're, you know, doing cartwheels or um, moving too fast, they're going to see you. Like movement is the biggest detector when you're hunting. That's how we see ninety percent of the animals we're chasing mm-hmm. is by them moving across a flat, flickering an ear, swish of a tail, all that sort of stuff. So I, I can't tell you the exact answer, but yeah, yeah, you can get away with a fair bit. I think what's been cool for this weekend is um, a lot of single file hunting or Indian file, where one person is leading the pack and the other person's right behind as soon as we're going for a stalk. And so pretty much the f- the front person is always dictating the hunt then. If they see any sort of signs from the pig, they stop, everyone else within the line stops, and then you've got no movement that's out of out of con- congruency, essentially, that the pig then sees and says, well, fuck, there's a human and I run away. Um, and that... That for me, like, I've, I guess I've always hunted like that with groups, but it's not always so succinct. It's like maybe maybe just off to the side or something. That can really just ruin that opportunity. Well, it also changes up from if they look up, they're only seeing one thing moving as opposed to if you're three people and you're three people wide. That's a big shape. That's a big mm-hmm. object catching mm-hmm. their attention and, you know, you're sticking out like the proverbial dog balls. <laughs> Who are big pigs? Dog, big pigs balls. <laughs> um, so I never understood. Not that I didn't understand it. I just didn't appreciate it as much as what I probably should have yet with the mountain boars, and it's because I hadn't had the experience of of big boars yet. <clears throat> um, yeah, we came down here and I saw a lot of pictures on the walls and I was like, you know what, this is a good place to get some mountain boars. We talked about it previously and the goal coming down was always to get a, a mountain boar and to get a, a buck down for me coming down here. Um, and yesterday, very first hunt that we went on, Randy promised us a lot of things about this block that he was, his favourite walk we were going on. And it didn't deliver at all when we first got there. We got there and there was actually there was a, a pig that ran off straight away. And then we kept walking and we did not see much at all for quite a while. Um, and it was, I don't know, what time was it? It was probably like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Like yeah. it was pretty late on. Um, and we saw him across across the valley, saw, saw a big boar. Um, and you got pretty excited. As soon as you saw him, you were like, that's a that's a big pig. That's a, that's a lump. <laughs> he, he's the kind of pig that puts a horn on a jellyfish. It just... <laughs> I don't know, something about mountain boars like gets me proper excited and yeah, this fella was in a good spot, but he's still probably six or seven hundred meters away and you know, a full gully between it. We had a fair bit of like moving and, and mucking around to do to get in the right spot and then hoping the wind's right on that side, the same as it is on this side of the gully and cross the creek, cross an electric fence and yeah, get into to range and it didn't go exactly to plan and Rob ended up having a stalk and yeah, well, we um, we came out. across two lots of pigs first, right? Yeah, there was the the one little um, sow that we got up on top of the hill, and then I stood on a stick and she was gone. <laughs> and then we went down the hill, and then we got over to near where he was, or we weren't we weren't definite. We I don't know you you definitely marked it, but at the same time we just got there and we're like, oh, is this it? Is that it? Is this it? And then we saw the the three little pigs just down in the thing and, and like down the valley and Rob had his stalk. Um, what happened with that? What was uh, it wind or was it? Yeah, I think the wind sort of gave us swirled up. Swirled a bit, yeah. We were pushing the friendship as it was. like <laughs> the, the way we were coming in on it and yeah, we probably probably could have done better but it's all, it's all learning and uh, that was a what not to do moment. Rob, do you want to step in for a sec? What what did you learn with that, that that in particular part, that hunt? Uh, mate, to be honest, on the small amount of sleep we've had on this trip <laughs> and the massive amount of walking, it all just 
bloody blurs, blurs into one <laughs> very big hunt at the moment. <laughs> um, no, I, I do remember that we, we kind of got there and we're like, oh, look at these three here. And then we were chatting between ourselves. We're like, well, where's the big boar? Like, he should be right here. And, I mean, we, we'd travelled a long way to mm-hmm. get to that spot. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, like Randy said, I... I had a stalk in and, yeah, they sort of blew off and they ran down into the creek and stuff, didn't they? And then there was that little rise, wasn't it? We're like, wow, you wonder if he's over there. And sure enough, he just, he'd probably wandered, what, 50, 100 metres since we saw him first and he'd just gone into this little gully and then it was it was on like Donkey Kong. It's funny because as, as soon as the... As soon as the pigs ran off, I'm like, I'm just going to peek over here real quick. And then you guys are like, Matty, Matty, come here. <laughs> so I, I came down the hill pretty fast um, and we saw him and we went over straight to him pretty much. Like it was, it was good. It was good country in regards to where he was compared to where we were. And I don't know what the bush is called, but there's a, a bush down here in New South Wales that has seeds on it. And as you walk through it, you hear the seeds rattle. And that's what he was in. He was in the thick of that stuff. So he couldn't really see where we were at all. It's, it's like a doorbell weed, nearly. <laughs> it sounds like you're rattling the doorbell when you, you walk through this stuff. And we're in a good spot. We had a tree, tree between right us. There. And then he was sort of head down, ass on, feeding away. And, yeah, like we... Well, it probably got to 50 metres and I sort of went, well, I'm going to stay here. There's a bar on the tree I'd, roughly, right? I'd go here and cut up there and... That's what I did. Good luck. So I walked, I don't walked down. Don't look at his teeth. <laughs> yeah, he actually said that to me many times. He said, don't look at his teeth. And I said, That's, <laughs> I'm not going to. It's all good. <clears throat> and so I walked down this little this little ridge. Um, there was kind of a log, a log to follow and it was down like a, a dead log down the ridge. I followed it down. I got to the end of the log and the way he was facing was directly towards me. And I said to Grant, what do I, like, I kind of, I looked at him like, what do I do? Do I keep going? Do I not? And he's just like, just go, just go. <laughs> um, and so I maneuvered my way through and just took it slowly and got up to about 12 meters in the end. Um, and I was waiting for quite a while. Like he, he just wouldn't give me a good shot opportunity. The patience was, was worth it. But like, yeah. On a pig like that, you can't like quarter and on when they're at that angle and stuff like that. Yeah. You're asking for trouble, mm-hmm. and you did exactly perfect. And he he read the script because he just swung around, Gave give you shot. that slightly quarter and away shot uphill. It was yeah, you couldn't have, you couldn't have asked for a better. It was a pretty tin ass moment, really. <laughs> like three hours into it, and you've put a I wouldn't say a Mount Bore of a lifetime, but you're going to be doing well to to try and top him. <laughs> top him. We're actually boiling the head right now, so I'm, I'm actually very excited to measure him up. Um, he probably is ready. We got to pull him out and see what the see what he measures. And I don't. This is how green I am to to bow hunting, or more so in, to, in regards to trophy hunting. I don't really understand the points system. So let's let's explain that really. Right. So on the on the pig, there's four measurements. So you've got the the total length of the tusk, you've got the length of the grind, you have the diameter of the tusk where the grind finishes, and you have the diameter of the tusk at the base. So let's talk about tusk and grind. What's the difference? So the tusk is, you know, the whole big white hook that hangs out the mouth, and the grind is the flat part on the back of the tusk, which the pig's grinder does. So obviously the older and more mature the pig, the bigger his grinders are and the bigger the grind on the tusk is. So like the through the scoring system, you obviously the longer the tusk is, the better. And then the longer the grind is, the better because that puts the bottom of the grind further down the tusk. So when you measure the diameter, you're getting a, a, a chunkier or a fatter mm-hmm. measuring point, which in turn gives you a bigger score. Yeah. So... Um, and then with the Douglas system, you obviously it's the weaker side of, of each measurement gets doubled. Yeah. And that's how you end up with your your total. Um, so when, when I first shot him, you were actually a little bit worried. Not worried. You just said, look, he's not going to score as well as he probably should because he's got a broken tusk. So first thing, mate, we brought it. We pushed the tusk in. We brought it and we pushed the tusk in. Yeah, let's talk. You, you go, to Corey. So we pulled the jaw out. We've bought, pushed the tusk in. We're loosening it. See how it's moving like that? Yep. Yeah. It's actually got a bit in there because I can't get it right out. Oh, here we go. It's, we just it's pulling very well. 
She's a half circle. I can't actually get oh my that's a big God. task. Oh, and look at this sucker. Should be video on that. Oh, I can't get it out. I didn't even have my phone on me to video you. Jesus. That's a good task, mate. Yeah, get your tape measure. Good. I can't quite get it out. You know why? Because oh. we haven't split the jaw. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Rigger. Should have um, split the head first before we boiled it. Sorry, mate. First time. Yep, that's all right. Forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe this snapped one will come out. This is exciting. Well, they're definitely loose, but I need to get this bottom jaw apart. So I... I uh, There's too much curl <coughs> in there. Given that it's the first head that I've boiled as a, a pig and everyone just said you should boil the whole head instead of um, breaking the jaw at all, like cutting through the jaw, through the meat and through the, the tendons and stuff, I just cut off the skin and all as much meat as I could and then we just chucked in that way. So um, Corey's currently just using his brute strength to try <laughs> to try break open the jaw so he can actually get the... the the bottom's out. Oh, there we go. Oh, he's done it. Look at that. What a man. Beast of a man. Wow. You're impressive. Oh, oh my God. Look at that. Oh. You know the juicy part inside there? Oh, Matt is going to eat that. Suck that out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> juicy part. <laughs> okay, so we've got the tusk. One is, one is very big compared to the other because of the snap-off, right? So now that they're out of the jaw... The, the smaller one doesn't look that much smaller because the bit that snapped off is bugger all compared to the whole length of tusk that was all inside the jaw, hey? Mm. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, so so off of the Douglas score, you said they take it the smaller, the smaller of the two measurements. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the smallest measurement gets multiplied. Okay. So, so we're doing the, bear, the larger tusk right now. Yeah, bear with us because we're... Um, I'm measuring and talking. Yeah, and live I'm a male, action. so I can't do two things at once, but, you know. So that longer side is seven and four, five, seven and six, eight. So I'll just write this down as we're going. Mm-hmm. Seven and six, eight. So. Six, eight, isn't that three quarters? No, it's all on the eights. <laughs> oh. So the way the Douglas system works, you don't, like, round up or round down, so it's all done through eights. Okay. So, yeah, you are so, you are correct that it should be <laughs> three quarters, but yeah, the Douglas system is slightly broken. So, what are you what are you measuring here? So this one now I'm doing the length of grind. So this basically goes that point where his grinder rubs in, yep. and every time he closes his mouth, it's it sort rubs. of sharp, like it it sharpens this edge up, and they yeah, use it for it. fighting other boars and stuff like that. And yeah, so it's that length. Is your length of grind measurement? So he's going to be. What's a good grind, roughly? Like usually? Anything over two inches. Two and. So you always round up with this two, so it's two and three eighths. Yeah, so he's using string and a non stretching string. Non stretching string and lining it up against against the grind or well, against the the measurement that he's yeah, doing. Yeah, like if you if you use a bit of string that stretches you can sort of you you grow a couple of points here and there <laughs> and before you know it, your twenty five point ball is actually a thirty two point ball. <laughs> or the other trick is you cut the, the first inch off your tape measure. And then everything <laughs> scores heaps better. It normally happens around April every year. <laughs> Is that why you've got to be accredited for actual scoring and stuff? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. So to, <laughs> to have the score, like, go through and be, oh, whether you're um, ADA or um, trophy takers or any of those, like, groups that keep a record of the score, you have to have the trophy measured by an accredited scorer. So you, you've not actually done your accreditation yet, but no, I'm just a but red the people who, who have been accredited, they say when Grant's done it, it's good enough. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Except when he does his own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's what me tape measure with the one inch is cut off for. <laughs> so we've done. So we've, we've now done the the diameter of the base of the tusk. So we've done length, diameter, grind. Yeah, so now we're doing the diameter of the tusk at the at the grind. At the grind. 
Yeah, but there you go, Rob. Base of the grind. I should let him do this. He knows more about it than me. So that's two and one eights. So do I'm, I'm just clarifying because I'm a total newbie. So <laughs> I'm just barking out what I'm looking at. Here. And so all of these scores added up together is the the amount. Yeah. That's so what what we'll do here just for shits and gigs. Shits and gigs to see what his potential was. We're going to double this up and do some quick math, not good math. <laughs> Corey's on it. He's actually got the calculator out. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I've got me thinking Go for it Thinking voice on here no, so. you go for it Ooh, the silence is thrilling mm. So 12, 14, 26, 27, 28, 29 What's like twenty nine points? Give some context around that. Um, that's a fucking good pig. <laughs> <laughs> Corey said that's a fucking good pig. <laughs> yeah, and I'll I'll back it up. It is a fucking excellent mountain boar. Anything, well anything over twenty seven points Thank out of the you. hills is a mountain monarch. Like it's a it's got age. You got to remember these things get baited. They get shot out by helicopters. They get dogs, yeah, dogs. attack them. They get the cocky driving around with the rifle, blowing every one of them up because they hate them. They are literally the, the scum of the earth. And for something like this, I couldn't tell you an age, but mature. He's yeah. avoided all of that. And Maddie ended up ending his life with uh, one one little arrow straight through the, the kill zone and uh, all done and dusted. Mate. Do you... Unfortunately, due to the fact that the other side's got a snap on it, that's exactly. the side we've got to measure up, yep. so that's going to drop it back a little bit. But Let's yeah. do that in the background. Let's keep going. Righto. So, Corey, I'd actually love to hear your your insight to this because I didn't really understand the, the – I don't know, just how good this ball was. and Like, I knew it was good. I definitely knew it was good. I didn't know how good it was until Grant said to me, man, we're lucky to take four of these off of here a year. Yeah, um, for sure. When Grant sent me that photo yesterday, my response was, fuck yeah, the first message. Excuse the language. Second message was, is that his first mountain ball? <laughs> Grant's was yes. So, no, I'm stoked for you, mate. That's a proper crack and pig. It doesn't really matter about the score. No, no, you know, definitely 20, not. The Douglas score that you've got is an impressive. I think, I think that's just impressive in general, right? Like just yeah. to just to figure out what that is. Because and I even the, I the part of the trophy it. that you're experiencing now is the hunt that you've exactly. come down here from Brizzy from, and what you're doing here with the fellas, watching the the tusks get pulled out of the water, and um, your your first proper mountain boar is an impressive thing. Doesn't matter what it scores, and you've just been kissed on the dick and scored excellent. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no. That's that's a proper pig. I could tell by the photo. Yeah, it's got to grind. It's got to grind. Yeah. It's got to grind. Yeah, even the broken side. When I saw it, it before we boiled it, it has a grind. So you still score. If, yeah. Even the length of that snap one's a good pig. Yeah. But the photo that you've taken, Rob, Rob, Rob's got the right angle. and Rob did an incredible job. Yeah, and, you, and that in itself, that photo is a trophy as well. So there's something special about the elusive mountain boar. Every, every bow hunter should be frothing at... The chance to hunt a ball like you have, and and you did the the practice and the hard work you did paid out for the shots that you've you've done. And now you've got that on the deck. So what you've done Thank too, you. my I advice. It. Yeah, good on you. I love it. I love it when I love it when fellas get their FOS, their first to species, and I love it when it's bloody epic, especially here in Deer Camp because this year, 2022, has been pretty bloody wild for people in their. F- First to species, like. Matt, it's just been a pretty w- bloody wild year, I think, in general it for has, people yeah. because I think yeah. realistically we went through a few years of drought where it was shit, shit creatures yep. around. Yep. Um, whereas now they're they're full and thriving, yep, and so right. a lot of people who have probably done it hard for the last few years yep. are now out there, yeah, doing their thing and getting good results for it. Yeah, the grind's a long one. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Randy's <laughs> underselling you, Matty. Randy's <laughs> underselling you. He's. Oh, it, he was measuring the snap and not the actual grind. Oh. The actual grinders on your pig that you shot yep. are very, very prominent. Like, it's a very toothy ball. 
Very toothy boar. Anyway, the the, the hunt isn't over. And oh no! I'm. You know what's it's crazy? Like this. Like I said, just the the amount of opportunities we've had. This this hunt has been just so incredible. Um, and like I said. Well, just in general, each each opportunity that you have is just another notch in your belt for you to understand, okay, this is hunting, this is how it goes. Yep. Um, I think actually hunting with someone like Grant, who is out here all the time. Probably and to too see, much. To, <laughs> to see the I things that he wife. does and then to, um, I mean, even even for him just to say, like, oh, that was a fuck up. That's just what happens in bow hunting. It's like, oh. Yep, that's right. Exactly. That's exactly Stalking, what bow hunting is. Wind, yep. wind is the devil for a bow hunter. Uh-huh. And... And we, we are very spoiled with the opportunities we get on this place. So Dude, incredible. Like, it is it's insane how good this place is. This so is why we don't tell anyone where we hunt, right, Matt? No. Oh, yeah, definitely. No. We we'll share the Secret. love with our circle of friends. Canamble. <laughs> yeah, Canamble. <laughs> um, no, but I was actually saying to, to Grant on the way down, I was watching um, some of uh, Collie's stuff. What's his name? Steve Collie. Yep. Um, watching his stuff. And I was like, where's he? And he said, oh, he's just north of Tamworth, roughly. And I was like, okay. And so. We're south of Tamworth, essentially. And it's just the amount of opportunities that we've had is just incredible. And it, it really opened my eyes to like, whoa, this is this is a different level yeah. of, of hunting. But you've also got the, the the experience of the blokes that have been hunting. Oh, the place 100%. Well. It comes 100%. Like the, the place does have the animals, but knowing where they are. and That's a big part of it, right? Yeah, like knowing your property, knowing take. your block. Well done. That's a quality mountain boy. There you go. Yeah. 26 off of the... Off of the 26 Douglas points. Broken. <laughs> well done, mate. Fucking wow. Look at that. Yeah, a couple of rumbos by the campfire and pulling a pig jaw out <laughs> for a first mountain boar. Doesn't get much more bogan, does it? No, bogan, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> this is what it is. This is, oh, you know what? We love it. <clears throat> I was saying to Rob the other night, like, bow hunting has consumed me. As, a, as an adult, it has consumed my thinking power. It's consumed my, like, everything I want to do is bow hunting. I'm yeah. like, all right, how can we do a family holiday that yeah. revolves around both? That's what exactly what I was about to say. I've got three kids now, married yeah. three kids, and I've I've just moved to Mudgee, and my my thoughts, I know it sounds weird, my thoughts to move to Mudgee, mm -hmm. a big aspect of it was being hunting. closer to hunting. Yeah, definitely. Although I had hunting down where I was, but my my boys, I want, when we, on Sunday last week, Harry and I were literally flinging arrows out of recurve bows at nothing, and we walked out paddock from the house all the way down the back chasing mm -hmm. arrows and he's only two but yeah. so they're not going far but no. he's two with a recurve no. bow in his hand yeah so teaches some good lessons from the start yeah exactly and and i didn't get that as a kid and i want that for my kids exactly what you said perfect description it's absorbed my life yeah yeah and i appreciate it, everything that the ugly bloke next to me's done for me because <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wouldn't have done it and and I've got nothing against any other form of hunting, but I just think this is a special form of hunting. It, it is, man. I think the, the experience that you have with the animal before you ever take that animal, you almost get to know them, right? Yeah. Which is amazing because you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction with, with an animal if you're shooting with a rifle or if yeah. you're, I don't know, maybe if you're fucking spear darting them or something. Yeah, or that's you, right, yeah, hunting yeah, with exactly. an axe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a bit different. But, but, but my, my <laughs> thing with it as well is I'm a glorified Bushwalker for eighty five percent of my hunts. oh dude definitely that's bow yeah. hunting right yeah <laughs> so I it, it, although now we can have a thousand opportunities if we want to someone for like Rob being out here is perfect because ample animals and to be good at killing as bad as it is you need to kill mm -hmm. yeah to, and yet, to get those notches right yeah, exactly the notches yep. you need to from shooting a target to uh, killing an animal is a bloody huge step in in any form of hunting and definitely you and put yeah. a heart on it and all of a sudden your, your adrenaline exactly. drops right yeah. and it doesn't matter how big or small it is when you start and i think it comes with maturing as a bow hunter as well when you pick i shot a ball last week with grant and we both sat back and sort of there was only a young boar and both looked at each other and went, should have let that ball go and but we'd walked for three days <laughs> you know and wow. i know that's what is a word bloodthirsty but we walk for three days. I don't know if it is, right? If you've walked for three days and you see a, a good boar. Yeah, 60 kilo young boar, but you know. But it's the balance. Exactly. It's balancing it out as yeah. well. Like at the, the same, at the same time, you guys have almost promised to do a job here to the farmers. Yeah. 
And that actually kind of leads into my next story. Oh, my next question, actually, Grant. And I'd love for you to go in as much detail as you can about gaining access to this property and what it's taken you, the time the time it's been uh, to build up access to, because it's not just one block, it's, it's neighboring blocks. So any insights you can give on that and how long the process has been, what it's kind of looked like, including the hate and the love that's come from it. The, the short and simple answer is, if you want to have a hunt and see a heap of critters, go on a guided hunt or pay access somewhere that's good. If you want to gain access to a good property and get in good with the owners, the managers, and have, have the position to be able to come up and do your hunts and bring other people up and do that, it's a lot of hard work. It's hard work to get the access and it's harder work to keep the access and it's a really shitty state of affair that there's people out there that are trying to jeopardise that by talking shit about you as well. So I started here with one one block um, and I was content with that. Um, a bit of a, a deal involved to do it, which involves coming up, keeping an eye on the place, being boots on the ground, checking fences, checking water troughs, like you come up, come up for a weekend. I spend half of that running around, looking after the place, checking the cattle. Today, cattle got out. We had to bring them back in. We had to go and fix a fence, look at where they got out, work out how they did it. Turn the pumps on for the water so the cattle yep. got water. Like it's a, it's not just a take, take, take. You have to be prepared to give more than you expect to receive. I was going to say, I almost feel like your relationship is give ninety percent, take ten percent. <laughs> I and it's not it, that's not the actual balance because the access is incredible, but it's like you you over deliver in the giving. But I think we we take for granted, like this this particular block we're at now. I can jump in my car, drive up here make a phone call and say, hey, mate, I'm going up on the weekend. Is there anything you want me to look at? Apart from the obvious, you know, do the rounds, check the cattle and all that sort of stuff. And um, I can come up here whenever I want. So, sorry. Good. Another, good. another rum can. <laughs> Keeps the stories flowing a bit better, you know. <laughs> um, it's taken a lot of work, like, as I said, I started with one. I've now got access to the, the two adjoining properties. Um, but that's taken a lot of years. I've been hunting up here now nine years, I think. And one of the places I first, like when I first come up here, I did everything right. Uh, asked and I, well, language warning. Fuck off. I don't want nothing to do with you was the response I got. Was that because you hopped out in camo or because you actually asked the question? Um, Young fella. There's, there's a bit more underlying to it um, than just that, but I think hunters get a bad perspective. He didn't know me from a bar of soap. I don't know him from a bar of soap. And what's well, not to say he had a negative experience. There's a lot of people that do the wrong things and yeah. that may have been it. This This particular circumstance was just... I had access to a property. He didn't like the manager of that property, so he put me in the same boat, and we we're all just on the get stuff ship. So, and look, that is what it is. You have to respect people when they say that. Mm -hmm. Have a nice day, mate. Sorry for wasting your time, and just move on with it. Subsequently, it changed hands, and now I have access to the place. So, six years of persistence paid off. But yeah, the rest of it, like yeah, I put a lot into it and I respect every property as if it was my own. If mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it at my own house, I wouldn't do it here. And if there's a lot of people that don't do that, there's a lot of people that just take, take, take. And yeah, that's probably why it's so hard to do it. But if you've got a trade, if you've got a skill that you can offer the farmer, do it. That's time, like an effort and stuff for them. They're always short on that because running a farm isn't an easy task. Anyone that does it will know. They're always looking for that extra 15 hours a day. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a skill, offer to labour. Throw hay on the back of a ute. 
you've got to give them something for them to give you something back. Mm. It's it's not, and if you don't have the skill or you don't have the time to give, you have to offer them money. And I was going to say money, food, like cook them meals, take them some grog, like all. There's a mixture of things, right? There's there's so many things. Some people don't like beer. Some people would rather a, a hamper with some biscuits and tea in it. Like yeah. it's you have to. A, introduce yourself. And the other thing too, don't rock up to someone's house on a Sunday afternoon at three o'clock in your camos, <laughs> expecting him to give you his full attention when he's been working six days of the week. This is his first day off and he's finally doing something he wants to do or sitting back and watching the footy or something and You're you want to come up and talk crap to him, do all that a box drop. Or... If you've got access in the thing, ask the other, like ask who you've got access through and say, hey, old mate over there, what's what's his go? Is he all right? Can you have a word? Like, can you ask him if he'd be open to me coming in and get one solid foundation and build from there? And it's, it's a lot easier. Once you've got your foot in the door at one place, you do the right thing, that cocky's going to tell the next cocky, yeah, that, he comes up, he does good, he helped me with this, he helped me with that. You get a, a good word, you get a good reputation, and it flows. It goes to the next property, the next property, and before you know it, you you may end up with you know two or three adjoining properties and have the opportunity to do this. Mm-hmm. And I think something else, like, and you said it, you said it in, in a sense that might not be understood, <coughs> um, where you said treat the property like it's your own. Um, and a good example of that is during during the drought you brought feed up and the farmer didn't ask you to do that. You just did it. You and your brother would alternating weekends, bring up feed for the cattle. Um, and he only found out because of the neighbors, I believe. Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, but I, I am grateful. Like, and I'll be forever grateful that they've given me this opportunity and I don't want to do anything to stuff that up. And the drought was rough. Like, Oh yeah. The places were spending thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a day just to keep cattle going. There's not too many people I know that could, you know, spend that money. Like we're spending maybe 200 bucks a week coming up, feeding the cattle. We got a hunt in out of it. The cattle stayed healthy and they survived through the drought. You didn't have to sell them. You didn't have to put them down. He didn't. At the time, they were worth less money than what it was to transport them to the sales yard. So <laughs> it was a really, really shit time for anyone. And the little bit that I could do to help went a long way and what the, the property owner really appreciates it. And probably from that, I'm going to have, I hope, a- access. I would say lifetime access, right? Yeah, well, like for the life of the farm, for however long this. But, yeah, but like, it's, because, it's because you've gone above and beyond and been a good human. It's not about the hunting at all. It's about how you've interacted with the, with the human. And it's nothing to do with the hunting. And I think that's the, the problem that a lot of hunters do is they, they rock up and they talk about hunting. They don't want to hear about hunting necessarily. Like they see, they see deer every day. They don't care. They like if, if it's on their block, they don't really, they don't give a stuff about it apart from the fact that it's probably affecting their their cattle, or, or their whatever their farming is. Well, the the other thing with it too is, it's all good and well to come up and just chase you know big deer or or big boars or the big animals, but when you come up here, like you sort of you've got a bit of responsibility to do some pest management and there has to be a balance. It can't just be, if you've got a property that's happy for you to just shoot that one big animal, then hats off to you, you're half, you're lucky, but almost everywhere I've ever been on, they don't like ferals, they don't like pigs, they don't like, well, they like goats because they're worth a lot of money and if you (laughs) shoot them, you end up in trouble nine times out of ten. So, But ask the property owner, what he's happy with you to take. Don't demand, like don't, you know, don't make um, unrealistic expectations of, oh, I just want to come up and shoot a trophy pig or I just want to come up and shoot a trophy deer. Ask, hey, you've been seeing much about him. Like, oh, there's, you know, mob of pigs coming in on me sorghum, making a mess of it. Make the conscientious effort to go up, look over the back of it and try and knock a few pigs out of that. If you're lucky, you get a good boar out of it, a couple other killers. You're doing him a favour, you're getting the hunt and it just keeps things ticking on. If you come up, you're only taking one thing a year, he's probably going to find someone else to come up and kill a few other critters. <laughs> exactly. There's always someone that's happy to shoot anything. So yeah. it's a balance. 
like everything, it's a balance. Yeah. No, I like that. That's good. And why I wanted to share that is because I get a lot of people reach out to me about um, about getting access and about just being able to hunt with people. And I'm not in the op- I'm not in this the I don't have the opportunity to be able to take as many people out as I'd probably like to be able to do. And it's because my auntie and uncle have been fucked over, and so they don't want people on their property. And I'm like, hey, I respect that. And as part of me is hunting there. I'm going to stick to that and say, sorry, you can't come with me. I'm not even going to ask because that's just putting them in a bad situation. Um, Which is why, like, I wanted to share it more so because of the persistence and the 10-year journey, essentially, it's taking you to get there. Um, I've already explained what my favorite hunt of this property is. So maybe if you guys could tell us what your favorite hunts of this property have been so far. I've got lots of favourite hunts, but yeah, my my favourite hunts on this property haven't been when I've shot stuff, it's when I've been with other people that have shot stuff, and a lot of my hunting here is walking with other people, and I don't know, there's something special about watching someone shoot, I don't know, special special animals or something they haven't killed before, or, or even like... A good memory that I've got is I we had Spinksy up here one year. I can't remember the year because I'm useless with dates. Oh my God. Yeah, it's Jack Spinks. Microphone, Jack Spinks. Yeah, Spinks. <laughs> yeah, we, we we went for a, a bush walk up the hill. It's The nickname's Billy Hilly. And because um, you've got to be part mountain goat to get up there. But one of my favourite hunts of all time, yeah, one of my favourite hunts of all time up there was with him. And we are climbing up the hill. We've we seen some proper big mountain billies up there and um we we're with kimmy i mean we were walking up the hill and kimmy we, guest yeah kimmy guest yeah and um we got to this cliff face there and and i go oh it's all good i can rock climb let's climb up so i climb up this rock face and it's a very vertical rock face <laughs> and spinksy goes well i can't rock climb so <laughs> <laughs> no i wasn't with you no <laughs> you remember no you did the same you did a similar hunt there yeah. anyway so i climbed up <laughs> Haven't they? <laughs> Either you've told the story so much. No, no, no. This is me and Spinksy must have been by herself or with Goz or someone. We were with we were with someone. No, and let, Rand, Randy doesn't know this that. Interjecting. Um, you can't you can't um, interfere with someone else's story, <laughs> and you never let the truth get in the way of a good story either. <laughs> and he just fucked me over. But anyway, we were, we were hunting up there. Spinksy, I was definitely with. So we climb up the hill and we get up there, and I'm in range of this billy goat, and he's a proper billy goat. He's the fellow we went up there to chase, and I've just fletched my first twelve arrows. Usually, Uncle Randy's archery shop does it for me. <laughs> anyway, I just fletched my first twelve arrows. And I'm shooting out of a Hoyt Nitrum, 80-pound Nitrum, big big bastard, big heavy thing. And I draw back and I'm 25 metres off this big billy goat, like biggest billy goat I've ever had in range. And I shot, let loose the arrow, and all four of my fletchers went flying <laughs> faster than my arrow did. Fuck. And Spinksy was on the floor pissing himself laughing behind me. <laughs> and I didn't, I, I, I literally shot, the, the arrow landed like... 12 foot in the air into a tree <laughs> and that that's honestly probably my favorite hunt on this place we did we both pissed ourselves laughing for a good 15 minutes and i don't know i honestly don't know i've got another one where we, we were, again it was me randy and spinksy and we're in the we're in the um the big cruiser and we, we, we crossed the creek and there was a couple of couple of pigs there anyway i go spinksy give me that recurve would you and there's <laughs> three or four little mob pigs and I jump out the car and we'd already had a hunt I think so we're pretty well spent and I jump out the car and draw back with this recurve bow and I miss by like I don't know 20 foot (laughs) and I shot this tree like the arrow's still in the tree now if you want to go and see it and then somehow on the run 40 meter shot drew back again with 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 Spinksy's bow and nailed this little pig with the recurve bow yeah that was a pretty cool one too but But, um before we before we move on to Grant something that you uh said when you first rocked up was Grant loves the mountain boys I love the foxes yeah why? Like Tell me about the foxes. I don't know. The cunning little fox. I'm a cunning type of bloke too myself. I just <laughs> see a similarity. Little yeah. little schema, hey? Cheeky, red-headed, 
bearded blokes. I don't know. <laughs> I've shot lots of foxes on this place, and I just love hunting foxes. They're my, literally my favourite animal to hunt. You know what? As soon as you said that, my ears pricked up because I would love to shoot a fox. So Haven't shot a it, fox? No, I've never shot a fox. No, I shot cool. at a fox once, and I missed him. I shot under him. Yeah. Unfortunately. I oh shot, a, God, this I shot a fox taking a shit. <laughs> Poor bastard. You remember that, Randy? We were... Yeah, Grant's got it on. <laughs> yeah, shit shot. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just love like foxes. You can whistle them in, but they're all so smart. When they, I don't know, just calling a fox in special, but hunting foxes like spot and stalk. And one of my first animals I killed was a fox, wasn't it? With you and mm. with you and Judd, we, we've seen two foxes mm. since we've been just walking around this weekend. And uh, I just think they're an incredible creature, right? Like yeah, just to look at them, smart. they're just majestic as well. They're almost like a deer. Like yeah. they're majestic. Yeah, there's something special. Every every bow hunter loves hunting foxes. Mm. This, uh, we, we always do this talk when we're in camp. We, we put certain species next to certain species and say, what would you shoot? Yeah. And um, so you've got, you're, you're on a hill, you've got yep. a fox, a big mountain boar, yep. and a, a decent buck. What yeah, are you we'll going go two for? at a time. What are you going we'll go for? go two at a time. No, no, you, you've got one choice. Which one I'm are you going, going for? Fox. You're going yeah, fox. Yeah, I'm, I'm all three. I'm the devil for a fox. Yeah. Even if it was like the biggest mountain boar or the biggest buck you've seen here. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, that's a hard one because... I'd probably, yeah, I'd probably shoot the fox. I'd, I'd say that, but if I had like a two forty point fellow buck standing in front of me, he's getting nailed. But for some reason, I'm I'm so cursed. You, you, so that's the that's the that's the order you'd go: fox, buck, pig. No, it changes. It depends. It depends on the size. Yeah, of the I'm going to go fox first every time. But ninety um, percent of the time, yeah. Yeah, ninety percent of the time, yeah. it's all the time. Yeah. <laughs> now I like I like hunting foxes. Uh, you ask any any fellas that hunt with me. You watch. I'll let you hunt whatever animal you want. You haven't shot a fox. So I'll let you shoot a fox. Right. If Thank we're hunting sir. together tomorrow and we see a fox, I'm like a frothing dog. <laughs> <laughs> like I, it could be six hundred meters away. We could be in a vehicle, and it could be on the other side of the valley. And I'll say, stop the car, and I jump out the car. My, <laughs> I have an arrow ready to go, and I'm running up the hill trying to shoot the fox. <laughs> hey, Randy. Oh, you're a fiend for the fox. You're a bloody menace for it. It works out good because I have absolutely zero. Well, I lie. I lie. I I have a little interest in shooting foxes because this one time at band camp, <laughs> we're, we're up the hill, me and Corey, and um, there's a, a young up and coming boar sort of thing and a fox. And every time that question gets asked, you know, there's a fox or there's a boar, I'm always like, the boar. Who cares? It's a fox. Well, when the the real life situation presented itself, yeah, you shot the fox. I shot the fox. <laughs> so why? I what drove you to do it? Ah, uh, mangy old fella. Yeah, he, he was mangy. The boar wasn't. You know, he didn't have lip curl. He wasn't sort of that that big hooky mountain boar that everyone aspires. And I'm a I'm a sucker for a big mountain boar. I'm also a, a fallow fiend. So mm-hmm. I. The, the question always gets thrown around, like, what if there was a big boar or a big buck? And it's, I think... I think you would say big boar based on what I've, what I've learnt this weekend. Depending on how big the fallow is, like, because yeah. I am a real sucker. I love me fallow deer, but You've shot big I've shot a few good fallow. So it'd have, it'd have to outdo your last fallow yeah, before yeah, you Yeah, it'd say. have to outdo my last one. But in saying that, there's just something about mountain boars that just... They get your blood boiling. It just it ticks something inside me that just excites me, uh-huh. and I can't explain it. I don't know why, but yes. it just yeah. It, they just yeah. I, I want to interject a little bit though because um, one one picture that you've got in the hut is a wild dog, and that was something that really got your blood boiling. Yeah, that um. That's that's a, a crap. Sorry, we'll, we'll interject there again. He's just pulled the grinders out of the the tusk that we're boiling, and Look at them. they're probably twenty four point grinders. <laughs> if we were to measure them up, like, these things are huge. You couldn't you couldn't fit two of them in a stubby cooler. <laughs> yeah, Look at them. tin tin ass Matty strikes again. <laughs> if there was if there was a, a record for biggest grinders, you'd be up Jesus, there. Jesus, look at them. It's impressive, mate. Soak it up and revel it because uh, it probably won't come around again for a while. <laughs> and that's speaking from experience. Well, I don't have mountain boars around me, so that's the first thing. 
Yeah, the the wild dog thing was a, a crazy um but we'd done a pretty big walk that morning. Um and yeah, like it it was a really shit morning actually. And we're on our way back to camp and cutting down this little bit of a bench into the main creek and um seen this first I thought it was a fox. And the fella I was with, Brandon, said, Oh, that's that's a big fox. And I'm looking through the binoculars and I say, It's not a bloody fox, that's a <laughs> dog. And he's like, Well, you get wild dogs here? And I'm going, Never seen one before, never heard of one here. Like there's there's one shot a couple of properties away, but it's you know, <laughs> it's a long way. It's probably fifteen K as a crow flies. And we yeah, we seen this thing and I sort of said to him, I said, Oh, He's another sort of young, like up and coming, just just getting the the wheels rolling on the bow hunt and stuff like that. And I sort of went, "You got to hang back a little bit because <laughs> stay this, here, don't ruin this for this, me." This is one of those like <laughs> anyone anyone that's hunted with me or anyone that's been in this camp knows like there's there's no greed in this camp. Everyone's Definitely here for not. everyone else. A I, lot of generosity here. I. But the good thing is, everyone that comes is that generous. And there's been people before that have come that aren't that generous. They, they ain't here no more. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's no, there's no return invite for the people that are <laughs> understandably that way inclined. Right. Understandably, I, man, it's it's not hard to be good. But Agreed. Obviously, some people find it a lot more difficult than others. But <laughs> I said to him, like, look, hang back a little bit, stay, you know, a bit behind me. I've really got to try and make this happen. It's first wild dog in New South Wales I've ever seen. First wild dog on this place, and. I have to have a proper crack at this. Got down and, yeah, we stalked. Oh, it was a real speed stalk, as Rob would call it. Um, <laughs> I was all but jogging. And, look, sometimes in bow hunting, you have to move. You have to make the move because yep. if you just dilly-dally and piss in around, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. So he was walking up a pad and he was head down, bum up, and he was just moving. I cut in, got down, I was walking the same pad. The wind was good, it was in my face. And um, he sort of took a bit of a loop out on this track around. And with knowledge of the property, which I, I always say is a really good thing to know, it's better to know one property like the back of your hand than have a hundred places that Agreed. you don't know. Yep. And less than places have a shitload of wild boars on them. But I think I've said <laughs> that line before on this podcast. Invite me, please. <laughs> But yeah, knowing knowing the loop around and stuff, I literally got down, cut this creek. It was in a cattle pad, so it was quiet. I probably made about seventy five meters on this this dog, and um, he come down, cut across the creek, got up on the high bank, and just sort of perched up and was waiting for something. Like he just sat there looking down the creek, and I thought it was a bit weird, but he's looking the other way. Wind's good. He's focused. I made some ground and ended up getting to a fallen tree that's 36 metres away. I ranged him about five times because I didn't <laughs> want to mess this up. Set the, the the option archery, like flipped it out and put the slider to 36 metres and sort of give myself a little bit of a talking to him. I went, don't fuck this up because you're not <laughs> going to get this opportunity again. And, yeah, drew back, put the pin where I wanted and executed perfect shot. It hit him and he went nowhere. Hit the deck, did a few circles around. He hit the deck and a sow came up out of the creek and started like having a go at him and, and hitting him with the snout and biting him and stuff like that. And I thought this was the craziest thing ever because I didn't really know what was going on. And I was like, wow, like this is this is insane. Anyway, I'm signaling for Brandon to come over because I'm like, shoot the sow, we might get a two for one here. And... Um, he come over, but it didn't end up working out. And then she sort of dropped back down in this creek and walked out the other side, and she had half a dozen little um, like suckers or slips with her. And it wasn't until like I'd got over there and I sort of started to piece together and think about what had happened. He was sat up on the high side of this bank in a position to ambush that pig or the piglets as they were coming in. Because at the time when I shot this this dog we're in the middle of that really bad drought like it was right at the very end of the drought before it broke um 
There's very little water around. There's like three spots in the creek that had water and one of them was about 20 metres behind this. The sow and the suckers were coming up to, to have a drink. I'm presuming it was a regular travel pad for them. Like it's a well-used pad. A lot of critters use it. And um, yeah, so went up, had a look at this dog. And I was super excited. I was buzzing. And I'm sort of starting to piece it all together. And then I looked down in the creek and there's a little bit of a like a half-chewed fawn. Um, and it all started to link together. Like this, this dog had set up that fawn in a position where it was just off the side of a pad in the creek. So when naturally the wind always pulls down the creek, anything that's coming up, it would have attracted their attention. And it just happened to be this sow with a few suckers. And yeah, he'd obviously killed that fawn or found it dead. However, it ended up working out. Dragged it there. Positioned it in a spot where, like when we got down in the creek and looked back up, you wouldn't have seen him there. He would have been, you know. You actually did like the, you kind of went down and saw where their their angle was versus him, right? Yeah, I went back because I was like, the pig come up and they attacked, like she attacked the dog and it was just so crazy. And I'm glad someone was there because <laughs> if I told this story without backup, everyone would think I was talking shit. You know what? That's why I, I fucking love that about nature though, right? Like you get out and this is what I really, really enjoy about being out bow hunting is I've had so many experiences like that of things that happen that I don't think are things that should happen. And you're like, whoa, that's just what nature does. Like when, when no one's watching, that's what nature, nature is doing. <laughs> Nature's crazy. It's cruel and it's savage. Mm -hmm. And there's no, it's definitely not a Disney story put it that way. <laughs> there's no um, cute, <laughs> cute bunnies in the forest and, and all of that. Every, As you everything's said, out to kill everything. As you said today, you watched a, you watch a hunting video with your daughter called Bambi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I, I, for that movie alone, I'd like to get Walt Disney and just kick him in the nuts. Because <laughs> that one film's done more oh, damage, damage to this done. than anything. This industry, but yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other rabbit hole. And if I go down that... I'll Probably end up getting we'll a bit cranky there, and fired up and, and whatnot, <laughs> but yeah. So I like, went down and sort of, you know, put myself in the position of the pig, put myself in the position of the dog, and sort of realised that he'd set this ambush up, and he had absolutely no no thought process that I was going to come up and ruin his day because he was on the hunt. So witty, and yeah, the the hunter became the hunted. So, yeah, it was like that's that's one of my own personal favourite hunting stories. But like Maddie's original thing there was what's my favourite hunting story from here, and it's all of them. Like I've got uh, a wall in so like in the camp there where we put everyone's like trophy achievements, whether it be a buck or a like there's. There's a minimum. You can't just shoot anything and get there. Like there's a there's a bare minimum to get. <laughs> Rob's um, reaction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I, it's still it's still early days, Rob. You never know. You never know. But um, yeah, like and every single one of those entries up on the wall, even if I wasn't a part of the actual hunt, I know what happened. Like. I was here, so we come back and we all like frothed over it together. But I, I enjoy all the hunts. I enjoy other people's hunts just as much. Like I'm a, I'm a fiend. Um, if you're there and you shoot a big critter, I hope you got a good rib cage, eh? Cause I, think be the <laughs> I was going to say the big hug bear hug you gave around, me, man. I'm, <laughs> I, I froth on other people's kills. I think it's very as, obvious. As much right. or if not more than my own. Just it's. I don't know. It's a passion. I'd and you said that to us when we first got here. I was like, this would be interesting, like, for the weekend. Because I believed you from the start. But actually to see it in action, where, like, you were literally just that that thrilled and over the moon for me. Like, and it, it hasn't stopped. It's just, yeah, it's incredible. This, we're still frothing now. Yeah. Like, what, what's it been? Two and a bit, two days two or something days, like that? Yep. And, yeah, it's still. I'm still on absolute high. <laughs> I was at home for us. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it is at home for us. <laughs> it's yeah, it's just I, I can't explain it. And like obviously, those that do do the hunting with others and and enjoy other people's success just as much or more than their own, they'll understand it. 
there's a lot of people that like to do it for their own thing, and bow hunting's a personal choice. Mm-hmm. You do what you want, but yeah, the the camaraderie and the mateship is like just so much better if you're doing it. Teamwork makes the dream work, essentially. Freaking oath. I, I think the other cool thing about bow hunting is that uh, you come away from a weekend like this with some really good mates, right? Like, we, we, were, all, we were all on, I guess, we knew each other. We, that was pretty much the, the basis of it, right? Like, we'd all gone through 12 weeks of the bow hunters challenge together. Um, but outside of that, like, we talk, but it's not like we were great mates or anything. Whereas we come out of a weekend like this, I'm like, fuck yeah, I just got a, a good belt full of good, great mates that I've got on my hand now. Well, that's the modern, the modern way now of hunting with so, social media and mm-hmm. everyone being so accessible. Is you can have really good friends through social media, but you may never meet them. You may never yeah. know them, and they can share a wealth of knowledge and and help. But yeah, some sometimes it's better to be shown than talked about. And like the the boys are probably. Agree or disagree, I talk a bit too much when we're hunting, but I just I like <laughs> no. to share everything and, and help. And oh man, I talk under wet cement with a mouthful of marbles. <laughs> when, when Grant says that someone else talks a lot, I believe him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you, if you're going to do a podcast with Benny, I would suggest scheduling in three to four hours. <laughs> Pick him on a spreading day too, would you? Oh, I will send the wife away for that one, hey. Probably make sure them, the kids se- kids and the wife are away. Se- make it a weekend. <laughs> send them down to Goldie or something <laughs> like that. Benny Fenson, you've had a call out. <laughs> but no, I've I've met some amazing people through hunting mm-hmm. and bow hunting in particular. Um, I've made some lifelong friends through it. Like, and it's yeah, there's a lot of good, genuine people that are the same, like give and take. There's also a lot of shit people in it, <laughs> but the good outweighs the bad, I think. And um, yeah, I, I think I think bow hunting breeds good people, right? Like because you have to go through hardship to to be able to be good at bow hunting, or to even just yeah, to, yeah to even do it in general. Like there's a, there's a lot of hard work that happens to make it happen. My um my my little sadistic thing in camp is always like getting someone a bit buckled or broken, <laughs> and it normally always happens. And unfortunately, this trip it's Rob. We've we've done his legs in a bit of a mischief. But he's on Sarge. He's, 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 he's on the rocky, rocky recovery now over here by the fire. He's he's about to go four rounds with the fire pit. I was a bit in. So first night, first night when you came in, Randy, you got in eleven thirty, and we were here since six. And the goal was to go out and actually Rob's got a um, a thermal scope on his rifle. So the goal was to go out and get some meat straight away. So we went for a little drive and we got some we got some fellow does down. I keep calling them hinds all weekend. I'm all in full full in red mode. I keep saying hinds and stags all weekend. I'm like, oh I'll say it. I say I say hind and I'm like, oh doe. And Grant's like, it's all right, dude. I know what you mean. <laughs> we, we meant what you knew, mate. We yeah. meant what you knew, mate. <laughs> um and then yeah, so we got them down and by the time we actually got home, gutted them, skinned them, had everything ready to roll for like hanging them overnight. It was three thirty, maybe three. Yeah, about three. I think <clears throat> it was three thirty. And we we're hopping up at five thirty, that's right. Yeah. And so we hopped into bed and I wore gum boots with thick socks on <laughs> no this is when we're out hunting um and my right hand side of toes just got absolutely frozen and i laid in bed for the first hour thinking about how frozen they were rather than doing anything about it <laughs> and then they got i swear it got to like 40 minutes and i fucking I, I, yeah i rubbed them and it wasn't until, like I was, I was flicking them trying to get some blood to them nothing was happening so i finally rubbed the heck out of them and tried to warm them up with my hands and they were, they were at least warm enough to go to sleep. So by that stage, I had an yeah, hour, hour and a half of sleep. I was like, what are we going to do here? This is going to be an interesting day of hunting. But it's just been that exciting the whole time that I've been living on adrenaline. Like, it hasn't, it hasn't been a dull moment. And, uh, yeah, it's been incredible. <laughs> it's, it's pretty chaotic and nonstop. And, like, I think... I think that's farm life in general, though, right? Uh, a, a weekend here, 10 hours feels like two hours... And it just goes way too quick. Like, what, it's two two days we've been in now. And, yeah, as Matty said that first night, I think we collectively maybe got an hour of sleep <laughs> and then 
back up straight into it, and we haven't stopped since. We had an earlier night last night, but uh, early yeah, that, night that was a grandpa night. <laughs> we Bing. watched. So tell us about <laughs> tell us about Talladega Nights. <laughs> Why is that a thing here? So this is actually glamp. This is this is glamping here. Like you've got an amazing setup. What you've done here is incredible. But you've got a you've got a TV and you've got some the, DVDs. You've got a whole stack of DVDs, and the whole time you are quoting Talladega Nights. And you're like, this has to happen. This has to happen tonight. The the. As as it's a effectively known in the circle, it's the Tintage because it's <laughs> it was the Leaning Tower of Pisa for a bit, but I ended up building a bit that was actually square, so we had to cancel that name. But um, yeah, it's yeah, she's she's a unit, and there's a story in itself, but I'm not going to fully disclose that <laughs> just in case there's anyone listening that uh, could. Could Get me? Yeah, RTA, <laughs> police officers, anyone in the road maritime industry may be <laughs> interested in that, but uh, that's a different story for a different podcast. But, <laughs> yeah, all of that happened. Like, yeah, we've got um, – it's a real good setup. It's, it's taken amazing, a while to dude. do. But, yeah, the TV come about um, actually for looking at trail cam photos. Like, I'm, I'm a fiend. I love me trail cams. I probably run about 20 – at any given time. Um, I think you're the first person I talked to about trail cams on the podcast. Yeah, and look, I'm no expert in them. I still set them up and get stupid photos. Me and Rob were going through some before. The one I had on a star picket, and, man, we got some full disclosure. There's, there's some nudity, <laughs> nudity deer shots. Yeah. He's the first person to ever upskirt a doe. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, it's, I may have to save that one and throw it up on the socials because it's a once in a lifetime photo, <laughs> maybe never to be seen again. Um, but yeah, like we got that purely for looking at that because you know three or four blokes looking at a laptop screen isn't the best when yeah, you've been three around. or four days without a shower and <laughs> you stink the high heavens out. So. We got the thing, HDMI cord to it, so we got like the, I don't know what it is, a 40 or a 50 inch or something like that. Go through the trail cam photos and then we're like, let's get a DVD player. Mm. We'll throw a couple, like, well, you know, late night, we're going to bed. Just throw something on anyway. We did that and brought up a couple of hunting DVDs and Talladega Nights. That was the only DVD we had in camp for the first 12 months of <laughs> of life. So yep. every trip was Talladega Nights. You're inside cooking a spag bowl, Talladega Nights were on. You were going to bed, it's Talladega Nights. If you're just sitting on the lounge, Talladega Nights. You're outside cutting wood. You could hear Talladega Nights <laughs> in the background. So I like, think it's great because it's one of those like most quoted movies anyway. <laughs> so everyone comes who watches it is like, ah, oh, under this part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. With the amount of quotes that were going on yeah, all night long. We're going to watch the sound down. Word for word on that one. It's, um, <laughs> I, I don't watch it anywhere else and I'd feel weird watching it anywhere else apart from here. It's one yeah. of those traditions. But um, that thing's been in the DVD player so long. If you take the DVD out and press play, it plays Talladega Nights. <laughs> there's just there's just Ricky Bobby there going, Ricky "You Bobby. don't you big red? Then fuck you." <laughs> um, I, the, we were saying that we should do some Kyoga Broadhead uh, advertising. We've actually done it. We we did it, but it was a bit of a a bit of a piss take, and um, <laughs> it's a little bit crude for mainstream media. But yeah. You, you get the gist. <laughs> I uh, I actually want to give a good shout out to Kaigu because obviously we've come up here and uh, we're all using pilot cuts this weekend and um, to see them in action, uh, I've been using the two blade because uh, pretty much I sighted into my bow with my one twenty five field points because they didn't want to ruin my Reinhardt. It's almost last. It's almost last stance, and so I was like, it doesn't have that much left in it. I can shoot maybe one or two. Through it <laughs> with with the old four they are, blade. They are not good for Reinhardt. <laughs> they are not good for Reinhardt, exactly. No. But when it's your only target, it's what you gotta use. Um and yeah, it destroys them. So I was like, you know what, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go four blade. The two blade is good enough as long as I'm shooting well and it's like I literally I got my ba- my bow paper tuned again. Put on the Cayugas and straight away, boom, straight through. Like no other broadhead that I had in my my stack of different broadheads that I've got lived up to the the task. So the Cayugas straight away, and I know I know you guys is exactly why you build them the way you build them was exactly the way that the paper tune was built, uh, which is the first thing. 
The second thing is is that um, after putting down a red stag with it, I was like, with a two blade, I was like, these, these things, are they do exactly what you say they're going to do. And I mean, they're tried and tested, right? We, I know that because I've seen all of your different pro shooters that you use, that, sorry, that use them, that have them, and what they put down, and the animals are incredible. But for me to actually put down a big red stag and get a complete pass through on the shot, I was like, Okay, they are a hundred percent legit. Like that, that mixed with the the two fifty. You know, so I shoot seventy pound. So that mixed with the two fifty um, bow hunters domain shafts that I shoot. Like I, I think it's an indestructible combo. Like I am so pumped on that combo. I, I have so much confidence in my setup that I'm like I can shoot anything. And after shooting the mountain boar, it's the first animal I've not had pass through on. I saw it and I was like, what? What happened? <laughs> It's nuggets. just because of how thick they are. They're nuggets. They're so thick. The old, the old mountain boar is like really underrated in the sense of what they they've are. got fighting pad. They've yep. got like they they're just girthy in the chest. They're just they're they're a unit. They really are. But yeah, that the pilot cut and the BHD combination. Well, three of the four of us are running that combination. Mm-hmm. That boar you shot. Pretty sure he rolled three times on that arrow. And it came out and it's back in your quiver ready to go. So mm. I I don't know how much smoke and mirrors I need to to, to blow on it, but um <laughs> the proof's in the pudding really. They're they're yeah. tried, they're tested, they're trusted. And I, I just they think, are proven. And I think like I've had a lot of I would say I've had a lot of troubles actually sharpening the broadheads until I brought the the right gear. <laughs> <laughs> so I got an Aptic uh steel. And I got the uh, the half round. What's the what's the file you guys recommend to get? So it's a hundred and fifty millimeter half round smooth cut file. Yeah, and I got that, and I was like, "Wow, that makes all of the difference." Like I was stubborn to it at first. So I just went to Bunnings and bought one, and it did not do the job. You do not buy a Bunnings. <laughs> do not buy a Bunnings. <laughs> yeah, I fucked up there. Um, and so once I once I did what you guys suggested, uh, it did the job, and it's incredible. Um, and the the big mistake I was making to start with until I rewatched one of the videos you guys have up. Um, was I was pushing really hard. I would set I would set the the broadhead on it and like push it really hard along it. And, you, and in the video, you guys say, just don't push it hard. Just go nice and smooth. Push it through. You'll you'll get a really good edge on it. And as soon as I started doing that, it's like, wow, there you go. It's it's really really crazy if you listen to what the manufacturers recommend. It works. <laughs> who would have thought? Hey, what? Like, who would have thought? thought? <laughs> who would have thought? The file that we sell works. Yeah. The the videos we put up and the method we use works. Um, yeah. I I don't know why that is. But, um, <laughs> who would have Who would have thought? Um, Give him a few more rum cans and the truth will come out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just actually think... Oh, the other the other person I need to give a shout out to is uh, Steve from... Steve Kelly from um, Mr. Minutes because he actually helped me put him on a belt sander last time. And I, I gave one to you that was a freshie. I said, Grant, what's your, what's your standard? Is this good? He said, yeah, it's good to go. And so I was, I was stoked on that. They are not that hard to shut. Like everyone gets a bit paranoid and... That's probably one of the biggest questions we get in our yeah. DMs. It's the and angles, messages. right? Everyone, I like to me. To me, as a brand new person who's not sharp and that much shit, I say, "Well, there's so many angles there. How do, how the fuck am I going to do this? One at a time. Exactly right. Exactly don't, right. Don't overcomplicate it. Yep. It's literally just sharpen one angle, then sharpen the other angle, then sharpen the other angle, and then in that yeah. curve with the 150 round, you use the back or the rounded part to blend the two angles together." It's not rocket science, but it, it just it's overwhelming compared to what you see as a I know a single bevel broadhead. You see that you're like I only have to sharpen one side. That's great. Let's go for it. Whereas it's like no, this like it's tried and tested, <laughs> like we said. And, <laughs> like and one other important thing with your broadheads, and a lot of people, manufacturers included, don't pay attention to it. The tip. The tip is the first bit that impacts the animal. It's the first bit that breaks the skin and it's the first bit that does the work. Mm -hmm. So if you're not sharpening that, you're basically, it's it's dull. There's a couple of donkeys Donkeys in the the background background going off. (laughs) Fire crackling in front of us. She's a pretty good setup here. It is. But yeah, that, that tip, that front part is doing, you know, that first entry. It's doing the first penetration. It's doing the first pinch. It's doing the first cut. It's doing the first bit of bone breaking. That needs to be sharpened. Work from the front, work to the back, and get all those cutting edges right. The 
the rear edge is literally for ease of removal from a target. As Matty mentioned before, when you shoot them into a target, they do chew the shit out of them, <laughs> but think that's what it's doing to the inside exactly. of the animal as well. So yeah. they are designed to make as much damage as possible, fly as aerodynamically as possible, and be as reusable as possible. Like we're, We spent a lot of time mucking around with the steel to get it right. Matty's bored today. We're going to pull that arrow back out, touch it up on I've the already, steel, and it's going back in the yeah, quiver. Exactly, it's in the quiver. It's ready to roll. Yep. Between, like, so the only thing that's ever stopped me from reusing one of the Kyogre broadheads is when I've shot it into, shot it through an animal into a, a, a tree or a log, and I had to untwist it because I couldn't get it out. And that was on, on a goat that we did. Well, look, we're not making chainsaw blades or masonry bits. <laughs> if you shoot it into a tree, that's not what they're intended to well, use no, for. No, it's because I couldn't get it out, so it's stuck in the tree. That's why. <laughs> hey, we get, we, get, we get a lot of people that complain and, you know, they'll shoot an arrow through something and hit a rock and it, it dings up or it chips or it breaks. It's not a masonry <laughs> drill. It's not designed for that. It's designed to shoot through an animal and bone, not... Shoot through trees, star yep. pickets, oh, rocks. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. But yeah, like they're designed, and I'm I'm talking here on the pilot cut. They're designed to fly super, super accurately, as Matt said, because of the design and the way it's done. It flies as close to a field point as anything, and like we did a lot of testing with them to make sure that they were feel point accurate and the proof's in the pudding mm, 100% well dude I want to say um, thank you again for having me out here we've had an hour and a half Rob what time is it 11.30 we've got half an hour before Rob can have his first drink so we're going to stay up for a little bit longer so Rob can have his first drink he's just done 75 hard which is 75 days <laughs> of mate, changing your lifestyle not drinking um, and days, he, I think it, I'm doing He's done incredibly well, especially over the last few days where we've we've worked hard and he's come back feeling like a beer or a rum or yeah, probably a rum or so for you, Rob. Hey. And uh you've held off. So you've done incredibly well. You've kept to you, kept to your things this weekend. You've even read your ten books sorry, ten ten pages of a book a day. Just did it before. Uh, he's done incredibly well. So I want to take my hat off to you, Rob, as well. Thank you. <laughs> you've done well. Inspiration in the camp and um Corey as well, thank you for coming on the show, mate. It's oh. it's good to finally meet you. Yeah, thank you. I, it is good to put a face to the name. Yep. Yeah. I listen to the podcast religiously when they come out. So. Oh, thanks, dude. Yeah. I appreciate From it. From the start as well, which is good. Like I was saying before, the old volume days where <laughs> left <laughs> the, hand on the knob. The and volume's it, changed, apparently. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the audio's got a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. No, no, I'm glad it's changed and um, I appreciate the listening from the start. It's yeah. good. Uh, my pleasure. I just love anything bow hunting. No, I definitely do. Yeah. No, I, like that was that was one of my big things. There was nothing that was straight bow hunting when I first got into bow hunting. And I was like, I always had so many more questions when I listened to other podcasts. Yeah. So hence why I started one. I was like, I have more questions. I know no one who bow hunts. This is a good way to do both of those yeah. things. Um, and it's taken and look a at long you now. Way. You've just exactly. shot a potential 29 Douglas score boar from a bo- podcast. <laughs> insane. Well done. Absolutely insane. Thank you. Congratulations. Randy, did you have something else you want to say? Talking about Rob's um, 75 hard challenge, I've started mine today. I went for a 45-minute ride on the quad bike. <laughs> so I'm, I'm <laughs> Close on. It's Look, it's close, but, um, yeah, we'll work on it. But, um, <laughs> no, I wanted to say thanks to Matty for, for having us on and letting us talk a bit of, bit of garbage here. And <laughs> thanks to Rob for coming up. And um, I'm hoping you're learning something here. And, yeah, for... Actually, before we do, before we do... Bail, Rob, it might be great for you to just say, what are some of your biggest learnings? Um, ooh, biggest learnings. Um, yeah, I think the the speed in which, uh, we, we touched on this before, the speed in which you can get into some of the critters. Um, the bow hunting that I've done up to this point has been solo and there hasn't been a whole lot of it and I've literally been tiptoeing everywhere. Yeah. So, um yeah, I've been amazed at the, the sort of speed that you can you can travel, and um, and even get into critters once you do see them. Um, I think that's the mo- oh, you know what the other thing is? 
I recently, before this hunt, I bought um, on both of yours um, suggestion a bloody good set of binos and a bino harness. Mm. Far out, and like not only having good binos, but having them on your chest. Oh, it's the Makes best thing ever. Right? Far <laughs> out. Oh, so good. So, um, yeah, that's definitely another learning. Um, oh, and here's here's one for the the, the spectacle wearers. Um, Randy gave me the good tip before we came up because um, I wear glasses. Um, he said, get in, get into contact lenses, mate. And um, I've worn them for the last three days straight and, mate, they're life-changing. So anyone out there listening who's a glasses wearer, um, get into the contacts. You just got to be so, mindful that you don't have your eye protection, right? Like you were saying, you're walking oh, through the bushes, yeah, you don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I've, I've worn either prescription sunnies or <laughs> clear glasses for the last five years, like every waking hour. I'm walking through the scrub today and I'm so used to just having eye protection on all the time. And I, I'm just walking through with my eyes open, getting flicks of shit all over. Oh, fuck, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> like I'm, I've forgotten to be careful. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that's a couple of couple of good learnings. Probably um, yeah, not not just about the hunting, but just um, yeah, a bit of gear and I think stuff actually like that, so. something else I want to touch on is uh, all sides of the mountain. And what I mean by that is today we sat in glass for probably a good what was that twenty minutes, thirty minutes, mm. just waiting for something to move because it was kind of ten a.m. in the morning. Um, and we'd been out for our, a bit of a walk and we're just waiting to see if anything else had had space to move or time to move around and we're sitting there watching over a big big block of land and then just as we decide to go great you said all right before we go let's just pop over here really quickly look at this side and as we did that i said like in my head i actually said i bet we're going to see something over this side like it'll be just the case we've been looking here for 30 minutes we'll walk over this side and we'll see something sure enough we walked over that side and we saw some pigs and And another two deer that's right yeah of course it's all just that little, like, it took us an extra, what, 30 seconds exactly. to, to saddle around the side of that hill. We glassed another bench, bench and a half, found some pigs, and evidently we got in, Rob had a stalk, and it didn't get a plan, but it was a lesson. Rob learnt something, and, um, well, we all learnt something. Move, be a little bit active, glass, move around the corner, just... Go that next bend, go over that next little ridge and why not only take you a minute or two, but you could find that critter of a lifetime. You never really bloody know. We essentially did the 360 of that mountain, right? Like, because we'd been on the other side of it. We walked around, we stalked for ages. Sorry, we looked for ages, glass for ages on that, that face. And it was all of, yeah, all of, like you said, 30 second look just around that other side. Just to quickly just double check before we left and it was it was all worthwhile. And obviously, timing is a big part of it, but it was still, it was all worthwhile. Just, yeah, it always, like, that little bit extra, I, I'm a sucker for it. I always want to go just the next ridge I'm over. the same. Every same new Same when ridge. you're fishing. Yep. Just, just one more just cast. Just one more just cast. Just one more yep. cast. <laughs> 100%. Like, hunting should be no different. If you can go over that next little ridge, that next little hill, see around that next little corner... Why not? Always, always Why the not? next opportunity. Actually, before we do it, just before we go for the, for the, <laughs> for fifth, the fifth before time, we go, down. I would say, uh, actually, just tell us about how you kind of plan our day of hunting, Grant. Because um, up in up where I go hunting reds, a lot of time it's like hunt till nine, ten o'clock. Everything's quiet. Go go back home, eat, help out at the farm until maybe three o'clock, and then go back out. So. Again, another open-ended question. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> so many of those tonight. It's it's all dependent on the time of year, what the target species is and, and what we're planning to do. So, like, for a, a quick insight into our first day was get up, go and do my favourite walk, which is the airstrip paddock. And um, we ended up blowing way out of that and going a lot further into it, like a walk that I wouldn't normally do. But... It's just what happened, and you got to adapt, improvise, and overcome. Matty ended up getting a good bore out of it, but yeah, that <laughs> a cracker, yeah, Rob, right. <laughs> a bloody absolute, an absolute pisser. But um, like I, I normally try and plan my hunt so like summer, where I'm hunting here, the first two hours of the day and the last sort of hour of the day is your effective time. The rest of it's you, 
you just sat in the joint up and you're walking around for no real reason. Unless you want to chase a couple of goats, um, the middle of the day is really good for that. But yeah, we pretty much, we want to be where we want to start hunting at first light and this morning. We hopped out of the car and we it's heard pigs squealing like a chilly. boar and we walked that body, off. what five meters from the car. I don't even know if it was five meters. Yeah. I think I just rounded the bull bar and as we just <laughs> stepped it out for Corey's garage, that's about one and a half meters. So um <laughs> Yeah, one and a half meters into the hunt and it was on. So that's what like, yeah. The middle of the day, I, I try really hard not to go into like bedding areas and sort of stir them up too much because they go back there, they're comfortable, they come back and, and they stay Keep predictable. Yeah. Um, in summer, that first little bit, in winter you can push it out a bit longer. Like, you know, first light is sort of your time to hunt deer as they're moving out from the flats up into the, the timber because they've been feeding overnight and they're not scared of the cold. We were minus three this morning, so a lot of the pigs were still tucked up in bed. Wait for those crazy first to rays see the, of sun. The deer when the sun rays came up today, right? They just they literally like sprinted for the cover. It's it's sort of like a the, I don't know. They must think the sun's a predator of some <laughs> sort because you can you can literally watch like the sun line come across and they'll be feeding relaxed and comfortable, and then as soon as that sun hits them, they just Take send off. it. They're just flat bickies to the cover, and I don't know whether that's a learnt thing, a genetic thing. I don't know if it's the same in other places. I know where I hunt, and that's just what they do. <laughs> but, yeah, that that changes. Like, the morning from, what, 6.30 through to probably 7.30 was pretty much deer-focused, and then sun's up, time to chase pigs. And, yeah, just sort of poking around, glassing. And we ended up seeing a fair few deer after that as well. But, yeah, early morning, late afternoon and middle of the day is really good for goats. I'm not fortunate enough to have somewhere where you can hunt pigs all day long. We're here. Yeah. Well, you can hunt them up to <laughs> 11 o'clock or something like that. But yeah. you got to come back and have a feed for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Talladega Nights has to come on at some yeah, the point. Ricky Bobby fix, but <laughs> no, I, yeah, I try and plan my hunts and I try not to hunt over the same place I hunted, you know, in the morning. I try not to go back to that same place in the afternoon or I try not to go to the same place two mornings in a row. Just mm. that way the animals don't get a pattern on what we're doing. Yeah. And so far so good. It's working pretty good for me. You'd say so. Sometimes it doesn't work and you go back to two days later and there's nothing there and, yeah, whether it's the scent slacked around or whether they're just not there, it's it's hunting. It's not gathering. Exactly. They're not just sitting there waiting for exactly you. Exactly right. If it was easy, we probably wouldn't do it right. We wouldn't be as addicted to it at least. No, nah, it's the it's the challenge. It's the, <coughs> the difficulties that you face. It makes it all the worthwhile. Like, Definitely. What have we... How many pigs have we seen? How many pigs have we blown out? So many. <laughs> How many pigs have we seen from a distance that have just gone, no, nope, see ya? Yeah. Yeah. What? I mean, we we literally ran up a hill today to try to get to some pigs, and as soon as we got up there, the winds changed and fucked us. <laughs> it's like the story of, story of bow hunting. Yeah. yeah. Cattle, goats, wind. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> Kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another whole different... Um, yeah. Another kettle of worms. Well, dudes, thank you very much. This has been awesome. It's been awesome to talk about hunting, but uh, it's been more incredible to be here. So thank you for having me. Oh, all good, mate. We'll, uh, we might have to try and do a re remap here. I don't know if you'll better that ball, but we'll give it a red hot crack anyway. Keen. That wraps up this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining us, team. If you did have any topics, questions, or you wanted to suggest a guest for Becoming a Bow Hunter, you can send me an email at matty at becomingabowhunter.com. If you are enjoying the show or you've enjoyed in particular episodes, please do me a solid and share it around with your friends. If you are not already, please hit the subscribe button as the more subscribers we get, the higher the podcast gets ranked and that definitely helps out for showing it to other individuals. If you are not already following me on Instagram, it's at becomingabowhunter.podcast and on YouTube, it's becomingabowhunter.com. 
Get out, team. Fling some arrows. Get that practice in and walk those yards in the paddocks until you find those critters. That is it for now, but not the last time that you'll hear from Becoming a Bow Hunter.